in testing, instead of being completely overwhelmed by the fact that I want you to test all your orchids and you have 500 of them and how are you gonna do that? And just start by bringing, when you bring in new ones, quarantine them before you introduce them into your collection. So you quarantine them, you test them when you have the chance, find out if they're clean, and then make the decision if you wanna move them into your collection or not not knowing if your collection is clean, but knowing that these, these organs are clean, and so now you have a clean group. So that's a good way to start. Anytime somebody says it's virus-free, that's a false statement. Nothing can be virus-free. We don't have test systems for every single virus. We don't know what viruses are out there. They can be virus-indexed and found free of. And you as a consumer have a right to ask that supplier what were they tested for? And hopefully they will say at least some video mosaic virus and a down and loss and spot. That's a good place to start. Those two are the most common viral pathogens found in orchid. If an orchid starts to exhibit symptoms, move it away. Get it out of the rest of your collection. Have a special place for it until you decide to get it tested and determine whether what you see is one of the viruses or is it an environmental situation? So one way, if you're not going to test it, see how it reacts being moved away from where it was where it started to show the, the funkiness that you're seeing. Changes food, change, maybe let it dry out, or maybe you got hit by something, it's a burn of some type, you know? See what happens when you move it away from the rest of the collection. <laughs> If it's found positive, move it to a special place. Now, I understand that when you grow in a greenhouse, your greenhouse is probably cram-packed full of orchids already. And you're not gonna be able to find a special place in that greenhouse. Maybe your infected orchids go in your house to a special place. You make that determination by the, the criteria that I set before, the monetary value, the sentimental value. You know, do you wanna throw it away? That's your decision. I never say to throw anything away. And just because I feel bad for them. I don't, <laughs> I don't throw it away. I don't know. Um, always use good sanitation practices. Question. Sure. When you've been mentioning that um, mechanical means of entry of virus, mm -hmm. there are uh, vector means for the entry of virus. Right. Is there any risk space? Simply from watering the plants? Yes. What is that? Yes. Well, because the media itself is a very rough environment. Um, and so when the roots are moving and growing through, it's moving and growing through that uh, those bark, that bark, or whatever media you use. And so it's creating natural lesions on those roots as it's pushing itself through. And so then you come through with water, and it drains through, and it could, if they're hanging above each other, it could go to a plant down below, or if they're um, on a, some type of a bench where you know water is coming through and then pulls out this way, it can be absorbed back up into other pots that way. So that's one of the main ways that um, transmitted by the water. Um, Splashing, not so much because it needs to be like a sap to sap transmission. So if leaves are just touching, that's not going to transmit a virus. But if both leaves are snapped off or there's lesions on each one of those leaves and there's a way for that sap to transmit it to the other lesion, that's how it's going to transfer. So watering, hanging above each other, yes, that is a great way to transmit virus. So unfortunately, not hanging orchids above each other is another way of making sure that you're, you're it's a good way to um, lessen the chance of transmitting the virus that way, which I know is hard because again, space is a commodity in your greenhouse. Did you have a question? It's wonderful that they're identifying all these viruses and they're giving us um, advice on the sanitation practices, whatever. But is anybody working on the day when virus infected orchids uh, that there can be a cure or a more a, a aggressive treatment other than the sanitation practices? I'm sure, I'm sure there's probably lots of people out there doing that. 
three-week speaking tour out in the state of California back in May. Spoke to 11 different orphan societies in those three weeks. And a lot of them had bandas. And a lot of them had this type of symptom on them. And the bandas were, you know, they were brought in for show and tell or for sale or um, their auction. And so I would ask the group before showing them this presentation what they thought that was. And I would get such a variety of answers, none of them having anything to do with virus, which maybe this symptom wouldn't be this um, extensive if there wasn't like a secondary reason why it looks that way. But none of them said anything about virus. And this particular banda tested positive for some video mosaic virus. The other one is Adonoglossum ring spot virus. So remember, it was first found in Adonoglossums, but it goes to um, lots of different organs. This lives in a Tobamo virus viral family. Now, if I were to go to the tomato grower that I was talking about earlier and said, you have a Tobamo virus in your greenhouse, panic would ensue. Tobamo viruses are very stable outside the plant. They are very easily transmitted. And in a tomato situation or a solanaceous crop situation, it's going to cost them a whole lot of money to get it out, to get the greenhouse cleaned up, and to bring in new product. Tobacco mosaic virus used to be called, uh, uh, I'm sorry, Adenoglossum ring spot virus used to be called tobacco mosaic virus, the O strain. But they found that it was different enough and unique enough that it only went to, Adon or to orchid, and so they characterized it as Adenoglossum ring spot virus. Now, for those of you that orchids aren't quite enough of a hobby, a lot of other orchid hobbyists like to bring in things like Dahlia or um, African violet or Clivia, bromeliads. Neither one of these pathogens go to other crops. They only go to orchids. So you don't have to worry about these two pathogens crossing over to any other um, plants that you'd like to grow. Foliar symptoms, chlorotic and necrotic ring spots, streaks, uh, flower symptom again with color break, or no symptom whatsoever. And these are examples of a Adenoglossum ring spot positive. Here's your flower break. Here's yellow modeling. And here's the yellow streaking. And you see the difference between the two different organs here. Now, if you're lucky enough to have an organ that has both pathogens in it at the same time, which is not uncommon, you'll know it right away. There won't be any guessing. It'll pretty much look like this. It'll just be symptom overload because the plant is so stressed out. And this plant, any plant that has, has both pathogens in them like these, they'll go down very quickly. So hopefully you don't ever see any of this, but it isn't uncommon. At every single one of the um, talks that I've given this week, I've been in Fort Worth, Austin, San Antonio, Houston, all four of them have had plants that have been positive for both pathogens. So it's not uncommon. Normally, if your collection is of the older orchids, you've had it for a long time, you've uh, maybe inherited it from somebody, the older collections generally are um, virus. And there's nothing we can do about it except no. No, you need to know. <laughs> you need to know that there are virus. So, unfortunately, there are other viruses that infect orchids. They're not as, as um, easily spread as these two, but they are still worth talking about. The ones that we're going to talk about are ones that are vectored by insects. And so we're going to talk about pathogens that <coughs> aren't stable outside of the plant like these two. But if you have a bug population, 
you're going to be able to spread them around throughout your collection. So the first ones we're going to talk about are Tesco viruses. This is the virus family. This hen from the guy right here is a thrip. Thrips are everywhere. Thrips transmit Tesco viruses. Tomato spotted wilt and patient necrotic spot virus are the two most common found in orchid. But they have, both of these pathogens have an enormous host range. So if your neighbor is growing tomatoes and there's a lot of thrips over there, very easily move tomato spotted wilt or patient necrotic spot virus, which both go to tomato, over into your orchid collection. Then you start to see symptoms like this ring spots like this. So what's interesting about Costco viruses is that I'm trying to find out how localized are these infections. Do they go systemic within a plant? Systemic meaning are they completely in the plant? Are they evenly dispersed throughout the plant? Or are they just localized to here? So I am actually working with an orchid grower who has large populations of thrips, he has lots of Tosco viruses, and so he's trying to help me figure this out. So what's interesting is right here is where the thrip had come in and pierced the leaf with its piercing mouth part. It sounds so aggressive. The piercing mouth part here. So it sucked out what it wanted, but it also left the virus there. And so as the virus replicates or matures, it kind of moves away and it starts to radiate out. And that's where it creates these, these ring spots. Now you would think that if you were to sample right in here and run a test, it would test positive. But unfortunately, this produces a lot of false negatives. Where we have to sample is out here where you still have some green going on, maybe a little bit of the spring spot, and this is gonna produce a really nice positive. So what I wanna know is, if you get this at an early stage, this is pretty, this is a, a, a pretty um, far, far along infection here, could I just snap this leaf off and have the plant be okay? So that's what the grower is helping me to try and do. So I supplied him with amino strips to do the testing, and he sacrificed his plants for me. It's not sacrificing them. I mean, he's got to pluck a leaf off, and I don't think you guys like to pluck your leaves off either. So yeah. he's not happy, but he's helping me. So when I know that, I will let you all know. So bromoviruses, that's the viral family, are transmitted by aphids. And this little guy is an aphid. And aphids like thrips are everywhere, except Oregon. <laughs> I was told by a grower in Oregon there is no uh, no aphids in Oregon. So I don't know what it is about Oregon that aphids don't like, but he's convinced that there's no aphids in Oregon. So if you're afraid of aphids, move to Oregon. <laughs> so cucumber mosaic virus, again, named for the first uh, host that it's found in. It's one of the bromoviruses that aphids will transmit to orchid. And this is the symptom of cucumber mosaic virus. Now it says mosaic, but it's kind of more of a streaking than a mosaic. So don't, don't hold the name or the symptom. Don't, just look for something, and here's your scientific term. Look for something funky, and that's what you need to be looking at. Um, this, unfortunately, cucumber mosaic does go systemic within the plant. So once you, once an aphid has come in and it's fed and it's transmitted cucumber mosaic, your plant is now infected. And nothing we can do about it, mm -hmm. except know that it is infected. Because all of these pathogens, they can be transmitted mechanically, which is through cutters and, and working and sap to sap transmission. Some not as readily as others, but bromoviruses and cucumber mosaic is very readily transmitted mechanically. How do you think you say that word? <laughs> potty viruses. <laughs> Every day when I'm in the office, I hear potty virus at least once on the phone. So 
it is coding viruses. I would say a potty if I didn't know any better. Um, again, transmitted by aphids. And potty virus, this is a potty virus group. There are hundreds of potty viruses, hundreds of them, maybe even more. I work very closely with USDA researchers out in Bellsville, Maryland, where they've made a career of studying potty viruses. If that lets you know how many potty viruses there are, we're trying to identify potty viruses all the time. The test systems that we have to detect potty viruses were created by these researchers. So they always have to keep tweaking these systems so that we know they detect new potty viruses when we find them. Very, very, very large host range. Potty viruses are detrimental, especially in fruit crops. So Actia does a federal survey every year, and it's called the Plumpox Virus Survey. Plumpox virus infects stone fruits. Uh, Texas is actually part of this federal survey. Texas A&M, Dr. Ong, uh, performs the survey here in Texas, but they have not yet found PPV in Texas yet. So far, we've only found it in Pennsylvania, New York, and Michigan. But Actia is the only private lab who is authorized to run this survey. So within it, and you have a very short window of opportunity between harvest and um, test results, 48 hours. So it is a very scheduled survey of about six to eight weeks. And within that six to eight weeks, we can do anywhere from 180 to 300,000 samples. That's a lot of pet material moving through a lab. Um, and, it is and it is transmitted by aphids. Chlorotic spots, flex on foliage, color gray, distortion of flowers. These are the common potty viruses found in orchid. Bean yellow mosaic being the most common. Again, bean is the first host that it was found in. This unfortunate orchid, it has turnip mosaic virus, which is a potty virus. This is, um, I call this the elephant man of the orchid world, right here. This is this poor guy. I know you don't want to go out and see this in your, in your collection at all. I, I said it's right in the circus or something. Yeah, well, circus is right up the road. Did you know that? Yeah. It is. <laughs> That's how I found my hotel last night. Had to locate the circus and then keep going. Okay, so you don't have to get rid of your plants. You do. No. Well, what do you do? I, I, you know what? Cody <laughs> viruses aren't, though, those are systemic as well. So they are evenly distributed throughout your plants. Cody viruses, Tosco viruses, if you have orchids that have those two types of pathogens and you have aphids and thrips, you might want to get rid of those. <laughs> Those, and I, I don't like to say get rid of them, but there's nothing else you can do except move them in your house. If they're grown out in a greenhouse or out in your backyard, move them in your house because hopefully you don't have thrips or aphids in your house. <laughs> well, you could. I mean, you can make sure that there's no bugs on them. Yeah, exactly. Spray them or use soap. I think soap is a surfactant, so. A lot of people use that to ward off the thrips. And oh, I don't know about all that. What is it? Yes, that's it. Thank you. Okay, so there are 30 documented orchid viruses, but only 17 of them are confirmed. That's a, that's a silly statement. Only 17 are confirmed. That's a lot of pathogens for one type of plant. Orchids. We don't have test systems for every single one of these 17. Even between our competitors and Actia put us together, we don't have test systems for all 17. But we do have a good compilation and um, can do some screening on your orchids if you feel that you would like to do that. Um, the amino strip test is available, and I have them listed in the next uh, next slide of what we have on test strips that you can actually do the testing yourself. Anybody heard of orchid flack? Okay, we're just going to pass that over. 
that's, that's something that it's documented and there's pictures and if you go out and Google it, you can see it, but that's the thing about Google. Nothing is confirmed, so I don't know how they confirm that this symptom is worth a flag. So I try not to talk about it, but sometimes people go, oh yeah, I've heard about that, I'm pretty sure I have it, but I don't have any way to test for it, and so I try to ignore it. Um, there are other labs we can send plant material to. Critter Creek out in California is one of them. I don't know if anybody has heard of Critter Creek here. Dr. Allison, the founder of Critter Creek, um, has been a longtime friend of Agdia's. He is getting up in age. I believe that um, last Christmas he had a stroke, so I'm, I'm sorry to hear that. But his daughter is keeping the lab going. If you if you uh, Google Critter Creek, you can see the services that they offer, and they do a lot of orchid testing, especially out in California for the, the big propagators out there. They use the same exact format as we do, that ELISA format. Um, their antibodies are different. That's the only, the only difference. Um, the cost, I'm not sure what their cost is compared to ours. I know that our testing services lab um, is kind of expensive. So, you know, it's something that you would really, you know, if it's a, if it's an orchid maybe that you want to, I don't know what I want to say, mass produce or um, mm -hmm. want to cross it with something, try and bump something out, you might want to have it tested to know if there's a virus in there that's causing the aesthetics that you like. There are a lot of plants out in the plant world where viruses are in there and they stay there because they like what it does to the plant. Nandina is one of them. Nandina has kind of a reddish streaky leaf that's actually created by cucumber mosaic virus. So they are very pretty. 